there is no way to get through to those with whom there is no way to get through. Now let's see if you can understand what that means. And we'll go into it in some detail. And I'll repeat it. There is no way to get through to those with whom there is no way to get through. Get through regarding what? Regarding something that will remain a mystery to the vast number of human beings on Earth, most people. There is no way to explain higher truths, higher values to most human beings because they're content with being as they are, with remaining with their old natures, with their little sufferings and their petty little victories and their tears and their excitements. Never mind other people. My question to those of you watching and listening tonight is, what do you want to do with your life here on Earth? If you wish, if you choose, you may know, you may live in a world that's 100% unlike the present one you live in. You can live the kind of a life in which you were living your life, not one dictated to you by everyone you meet, by circumstances. And your life has not lived, lived according to the dictation of your own yearnings, your own painful desires. Have you noticed how you're driven around by your painful desires? How you want something, you want to go after something, and it drives you? We will show you how to cease being a driven human being and become a man or a woman who lives from himself. Now, if you don't understand what that means, don't strain at it. Just listen, and you will see what it means to live from your own true nature. Why is it so difficult to get through to any of us, to any human beings, about this new way, this invisible world that we're talking, that we're talking about? Don't, don't imagine what this new world is like, but find out what your present world is like, is what we're going to do now. You'll see what the obstacles are that stand in your way of finding something utterly new. And first of all, it consists of your fearful reluctance to simply walk away from yourself. That means to walk away from both what you call your valuable items and also what you call your unwanted items in your life, in your day. Because you put great false value on the accumulation of thoughts, of experiences, of emotional impacts, you put great value on those and you think that they make up you. So you won't walk away from what you think you are, because if you do that, you're afraid you won't know what your new identity will be. Now, this is very simple to explain, but you're going to have to work for it for a long time to understand it from yourself. Picture a man who has a large piece of glass in the shape of a diamond, and he goes around telling everyone that he owns a diamond, diamond worth half a million dollars. Picture it now. This is what we are doing, human beings are doing. He goes around telling everyone that he has a diamond worth a half a million dollars. It's glass. But he goes around telling everybody what he owns, what he is. He's a wealthy man, right? He's a man who has something very rare, something that not everyone else has a diamond worth a half a million dollars, and he wants everybody to know. You know what his hell is? I'll tell you what it is, and you see the parallel. 
friends come over and they say, listen, I know a jeweler and he'd be glad to put this stone that you call a diamond under the jeweler's light and examine it for you and tell you once and for all for you to know and for us to know whether it's a diamond or not. See his fear. His fear is that his own fakery, which he knows it because he lives it, he fears that his fakery will be exposed. And yet, incredible as it is, he's getting a vibration of thrill out of going around and saying it is a valuable diamond. Just saying it. But now he's in this contradiction we talked about, is he not? He says, I have a diamond worth a million dollars, and he knows it's a fake. Now he's in pain because he, he, he knows that he's a, a walking fake, going around telling people something that isn't true, and he's afraid that he's going to be seen through by them and eventually by himself. And the last, the last thing he's going to do is let himself in on the fakery because then he would have no identity at all, nothing that he thinks is valuable. Now look at this very strange situation. Human beings won't give up their faults diamonds, which are really glass. They won't give them up for fear they'll be poor. They fear they will lose their security. They fear they'll lose their control. They fear they'll lose their happiness, which they never had in the first place. Look at the straight, let's look at it. Slow down and, and see how strange it is. You tell a man, you come along with me and explore the highway to another world and you can find it. And already he's afraid that you're going to take away his, the joy in his life. He has no joy. He never had anything like that to, be, to begin with. But he's afraid you're going to steal something of value from him. See what human beings are like. Little tiny children playing their games. You come along and you disturb that game. You, you tell grown-up little children that they're playing self-punishing games, which can only keep them scared because the game has to come to an end, and it comes to an end any time they don't get what they want. They're playing the little game, and the one child wants to be king, and the other child wants to be king, and they fight, don't they? I wonder how closely you've seen a description of your life so far that you, to yourself, I don't say you go around to the world so much because maybe no one pays any attention to you. I'm talking about that inward drama that you have set up, looking for something which I'll give you, I'll give you a new phrase to think about. Smiling sorcery. You know what smiling sorcery is? Well, let's see what it is. The world refuses truth, refuses real life, refuses to let truth get through to them because they prefer smiling sorcery, which is simply a form of friendly magic which goes something like this. See if this applies to you. It does. Lost people say, somewhere in this world there must be a friendly force. There must be a benevolent power that if I can just get in touch with it, it will let me have what I want. Smiling sorcery, that is a pleasant, friendly force that if you could contact it in some way, would give you what you want. You want to change your nature, you just get everything you want, money, whatever. Does this explain to you people who uh, want the stars to do something for them? Does it explain mechanical religion to you? Does it explain superstition and endless foolish and shallow things that human beings do in an effort to contact this power? It's all, the, the problem is it's all so vague. And I mentioned mechanical religion. Did you make a connection when I said that? People build up their own gods. 
And that God just happens to be one who's paying attention to them, their little egotism all the time. He's going to give them their petty little rewards and even take revenge on their enemies for them. Can you imagine a human being who worships a God who takes revenge on other human beings for the sake of the person who says he worships that God? Do you know what insanity is? I've just given you a brief description of it. Human beings are like, uh, have you ever been to a zoo? And you see the caged animal pacing back and forth. He gets to one end of the cage and he turns around back and forth and all the time he's looking out, right? Can you imagine one animal at the end of a long day of pacing back and forth a thousand times, he looks over to the tiger in the next cage and he boasts to the tiger where he's been all day and what he's been doing. Human beings do not know that they're in a cage. They don't realize they're in a thought cage. That's what it is, made up of thoughts. Try to tell them. You try to tell them that, and they'll tell you of the great adventures they had out in the world today, of the places they went, the great things they accomplished. The tiger pacing back and forth all day long, going no place looking anxiously out between the bars. This is the life of people. I'm not talking about animals inside a zoo. I'm talking about humanity. And in their pain and their desperation, they wander around to the back of the cage and the side and fight with other animals, don't they? Every one of them inside of a cage and unable to realize it. Well, let's see. Will you stop your pacing back and forth in your life, in your own way, long enough to simply realize where you are and what you did all day long today? Were, were you in peace of mind today? You were not, and you know it, and I know it. Were you in a right relationship today with everyone you met? Hardly. When you go out into the world with the objective of getting something from another person, you are in a wrong relationship, not a right relationship. I'm talking about this type of, of greed, of acquisitiveness, acquisitiveness, of simply looking at the whole world as a sort of prey for you to go after. Oh, is that shocking? to hear you described like that? Well, I'll leave it to you. I'll leave it to your honesty right now, ladies and gentlemen. I'll leave it to your honesty to tell me whether I have described you accurately or not. Now, <clears throat> did any of you get angry? Any of you get resentful? Uh, why? You see, we get angry when the truth comes close, right? When the truth comes close to what we're hiding, we get nervous, we get upset. And in our childishness, in our stupidity, in our self-destruction, all we know is to get mad. Now, how about you? Have you as yet risen into spiritual maturity where you never get mad at anything at all? Which means you were so powerful. You have total power over the world when you don't get mad at it. Don't you dare, don't you dare sit here and call anger virtue. Of course you're going to do that if you want to stay angry, if that's your choice of life, if you want to burn yourself up. That's up to you. Don't you want to have something that is really noble, something that comes from up there, something that never gets angry which means it has total strength, never gets angry because it's never threatened by anything. Isn't your, isn't your hostility a form of defense? Of course it is. Now suppose you so well understood spiritual matters, which you can if you wish, so that you didn't have a central self there at all, an ego self, so that you no longer had it because it would have been dissolved in understanding of what it's all about. 
then would you have to blast out at anyone? Would you have to demand your rights left and right? Demand that people give you what you want? No, you, you wouldn't destroy yourself like that anymore, would you? Do you understand that the, the principle of self-destruction is a must for your study, for your careful examination? Because unless you see what you are doing to yourself by living with your present nature, you're not going to have an urge or an incentive for finding something higher. Now slow down on that one. You must begin to see what your present nature is doing against yourself. Otherwise, it will not only just continue, but your self-destruction will increase. That means that your misery will increase. Your fear will increase. Everything that is wrong will increase because you're either getting better or you're getting worse. And getting better will be as a result of you yielding to the truth. Then, more specifically, how do we go about letting ourselves see something higher than our own former nature? How do we let the truth get through to us instead of resisting it? Remember the following. This may seem like a, a very strange doorway to you, but I'll guarantee you personally that it works. The question was, how do we become authentically receptive to something higher than our own neurosis, our own confusion? Here's how. You suspect that there's a conspiracy. You suspect that there is something wrong operating inside of you. Get rightly suspicious about it. Fear. Do you have fear in you? Do you have fear? Yes, you, you know you do. You're a bundle of fear. You're so afraid that you get angry when you hear something different from your usual religious platitudes. You get frightened. You want to say to the world, go away and let me sleep. You try to sleep in this room. You'll never go to sleep here. You may go away, but you'll never go to sleep. You go to sleep out there. Fear is a treacherous guide that will lead you into dangerous places. Back to the word treachery. Suspect that invisible, unseen, and, and very evil treachery is going on inside you. Now, you. There's nothing wrong with you doing that. It's not harmful. It is healthy. It is harmful not to suspect it because that is your actual condition. Your life is a mess and you know it. Ah, so that's the direction of my suffering. There is treachery on the inside. And the man said that fear is a dangerous guide that will take me into dangerous places. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Isn't that explaining something that you never could explain before? We've got the location inside each one of us. We've identified the enemy, which is our fears? Yes, something, I don't know what it has been up until now, has been leading me into dangerous situations, both out with other people in that world out there and keeping me in danger with myself. Well, well isn't that interesting? This fear with which I'm so well acquainted and which seems so automatic so compulsive. This fear is an enemy. If I could see that, maybe that would help truth to get through to me. All right. Now, put together another thought that you've gained in this room. The thought that there is fear, treacherous fear, operating inside you. But that treacherous fear is not you, okay? 
It is inside you, yes, most definitely, and it's dreadfully punishing. Isn't it punishing to be scared? Haven't you, haven't, you, haven't you ever been so scared that you broke down and cried or that you ran away? Haven't you, haven't you seen other people so terrified they threw their hands over their face and they broke down? Haven't you seen people confused and scared? Did you know that something wrong was operating inside of them? I'll tell you, and I'm going to tell the world that I'm on to fear. 100%, I've got its number, I know all about it, it doesn't stand a chance, and if you listen to me, it won't stand a chance with you anymore. Because you'll see that it is a, a foreign invader inside your psychic system. And while you can't do anything about it, you're helpless. Of course you're helpless. You always have been. Admit it. You can also know of the existence of real divine power. This is not a religious talk. These are the facts, which is real religious talk, real spirituality, the phony spirituality that, that ruins people, my heavens. Are you aware of that a little bit? Have you been misled? All right. Truth wants to get you out of all confusion that had been, that had been pumped into you in the past so that you know with very quiet confidence, something that you never knew before, and you went to church 10,000 times, and you read religious books all your life. But there's one thing you never really knew. You, you never really knew up to this point that there is a God, that there's a power outside of you, and the power that's going to chase out this fear as you let it. Can you admit at this point, all of you watching tonight, that you've never been able to do anything with yourself, right? Then can you admit that? If, if you really can, if you really do that in your heart, then God knows that, and that's a prayer which will be answered. Now, if you can't do anything about your fear, but God can, how does that affect you? Do you see my point? You're going to get confused for a long while. You could make it short if you want, if you yield fast enough. There is fear inside of you, and you're told that it doesn't belong to you, and you're also told there's not a thing you can do about it, which is a fact that only reality itself, truth itself, can chase out the fear. Now, don't you fall into the trap of the word belief. If you fall into the trap of the word belief, then all of what I said to you will become intellectualized, and you'll stay as you are, and you'll still have your own madness, your own viciousness inside you, the madness that is driving you mad, isn't it? Aren't you driving yourself mad? Of course you are. What do we do? Well, I'll tell you what. You stay right in the middle. Listen to this now. You stay right in the middle of all the jolts that go on inside of you, all the fear that goes on inside of you, without lifting a finger, without going into one tiny little thought to put an end to your fear. If you go into thought about it, you increase it. Because this, the other thought says, I am God and can chase out fear. That's a thought, another thought, and a fearful thought at that. When you really give up by doing nothing, you'll stop thinking about all this, and you'll see instead. Do you know the difference between thinking and seeing? When you're seeing, you don't have to think. Someone describes a beautiful island to you. And he says it's pretty palm trees and coconuts and breezes and pretty lagoons. You have to think about it, don't you? You think. You repeat in your mind what he told you, the palm trees and the lagoons. When you go there, you don't have to think anymore, do you? You see. That's a, an illustration and a necessary one. I want you to know that you can stop thinking about all these matters that you're trying to gain. You can stop thinking about them and simply know them. You can simply see them. 
when you're ashamed of something, isn't that the same thing as the cessation of thought? This is, this is the problem. Having lived in the world of intellectualizing, of ideas, of beliefs, of convictions, of vanities, having lived in that world totally up till now, you can't quite understand what the man is talking about when he says that there's another world and an invisible world, a world that is above the mind. So I have to ask you again now, how sincere, how deeply do you want to understand? If you have a very hard brick of egotism in you, that's going to be opposed to, to your seeing, to your finally seeing. That means you're going to have to direct your attention to see that brick of hardness, right? And that brick of you, you foolish people, going out of here after hearing this truth, God's truth, and being influenced by a single word you hear passing someone on the boulevard. I have told you the way it is, right? So you have nothing from yourself. Anyone can tell you what to think, what to do. Let me tell you a brief experience that will illustrate that. A lady, I met a lady in a library a long, long time ago in Los Angeles, and she was telling me of a certain book she was going to read because it was going to help her. And I knew that the book was not going to help at all, and I told her that and her whole world collapsed right in front of me. Her face collapsed. She had been depending on that lead that someone else had recommended to her. Know from yourself, see from yourself, and you'll live from yourself. 